Well, the last 10 days have been very exciting for India's space tech story, to say the least. On the 18th of November, Skyroot Aerospace made the prarm for India's new age rocketry and launched India's first privately built rocket. A week later, Pixel and Dhruva hitched a ride on an ISRO PSLV, marking another first. The many firsts for Indian space tech startups in 2022 don't end there. Excited to take off soon, a few days ago, Agnikul set up India's first private rocket launch pad and mission control. Where? Well, in the backyard of ISRO, the mother of India's space program. And that speaks volumes. Indian space tech startups have truly come of age. Look at the number of space tech startups wanting to take off. Now at over 100, with half of them being added in the last year alone. Investors have started lining up at the launch pad too. Funding for the Indian startup space in the space tech area has gone up by five times from 22 million in 2020 to over 100 million in 2022. But founders will tell you, it hasn't been easy until the liberalization of India's space economy in 2020. Now, a host of agencies, NSIL, InSpace, ISPA, they're all creating an enabling environment for private sector participation. A new space policy is also in the works. The opportunity is big. Satellites are getting smaller and sharper and want a cheaper and faster ride-sharing option. An Uber or an Ola to space, more than 20,000 smaller and sharper satellites are estimated to be launched in the coming decade. At least 100 countries don't have a satellite of their own. To tap this space, fun intended, Indian space tech startups took the giant leap in 2022 and 2023 is going to be equally monumental as many look to start commercial operations. Hello and welcome to Young Turks, India's longest running show on startups and entrepreneurship. I'm Shireen Bhan and with me today is a group of entrepreneurs who are reaching out for the stars, quite literally. Joining me now, Pavan Kumar Chandana, the co-founder of Skyroot Aerospace and Moin SPM, the co-founder of Agnikul Cosmos. Also with us on the show, Avais Ahmed, founder and CEO of Pixel and Chaitanya Dora, the co-founder and CFO of Dhruva Space. Uh, uh, gentlemen, appreciate you joining us here on the show. What an exciting time it is uh, for Indian space tech startups. Pavan, let me start by asking you about your story and the journey uh, to building India's first privately launched rocket. Uh, and congratulations to you and your team at Skyroot. Pavan, you know, many would would not believe that you started only in 2018, that that's when the Skyroot journey of taking this aspiration and making, a rea making it a reality began. And here we are in 2022, and you've actually been able to launch India's first privately built rocket, Vikram, in November. Pavan, take us through this journey. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, you know, journey, Sharen. In fact, uh, in 2018, when we started off, there was no policy. And, uh, you know, people said they uh, would never raise enough capital to build and launch rockets. And, uh, in fact, we never knew, like, when the policy will come, you know, whether we'll get capital, whether there's technical competence, you know, we could build a team which could, uh, you know, build rockets and launch to space. Uh, however, I think there it is, uh, you know, four years, great journey. And the policy has opened up a couple of years ago. Uh, we were able to raise capital, uh, you know, to get here. And, you know, we, you know, formed the a team which could build India's first uh, privately built rocket and launch it to space. It has been a phenomenal journey, a lot of ups and downs, uh, but of course, you know, a very memorable journey altogether. Everything, all pieces coming together at the right time, in the right place, and then, you know, launching to space. It's been a phenomenal journey overall. Moin, let me address that issue with you. And once again, congratulations to you and your team at Agnikul. And, you know, as I uh, pointed out to Pavan, even your journey, Moin, 2017, that's really when you started uh, Agnikul. And look at where you are today, setting up India's first private rocket launch pad, uh, of course, in ISRO's backyard. But again, the distance from idea, aspiration to reality, really compressed. Uh, first of all, I think today is the five years of Agnikul. So we in incorporated the company on December 1, 2017. So I think that's five years of journey for us. Officially. Well, congratulations. Congratulations. What a day to have you on, Moin. Thank you. Thank you, Shireen. Yeah. And uh, as like, you know, Pavan was also telling about like, you know, the policy factor, the investment factor, all of these things, we were also anticipating the same kind of like uh, hurdles in our journey, but with respect to the policy, I think establishment of InSpace was a major turnover. I think once that started happening, things started becoming very easy in, the, in explaining things to investors as well. 
because like the investors have, as uh, Pavan was also telling, the thesis was not there and more importantly, they were worried about the uh, legal aspects of it. And once that started becoming clear, I think uh, a lot of the space companies have actually raised money. And I think uh, you were also mentioning about 100 space startups coming up. I think that's that's the entire aspect of it, right? The legal and the finance comes together. I think all your problems are solved. And then you focus on the technology aspect of it. I, and that's exactly that is what we are focusing on. Well, you know, uh, speaking about the road ahead, uh, uh, given the journey already covered, as well as the fact that whether it's the policy environment or it is the support coming in from both the private sector as well as uh, ISRO and others, as well as perhaps a lot of international interest, uh, what what is planned now as far as priorities are concerned, Moin, before I get away, and Chaitanya to come in? Can you please repeat your question? I'm sorry, I just had a, some kind of a... Uh, yeah, I was asking... I was asking you about what the priorities are now going to be, more in Year five done, uh, you know, right. what's what's the priority from here? Yeah, the first priority is to have our uh, launch. That is the more important one because that will be ex uh, exactly demonstrating our technological progress as well because we will be doing liquids and uh, that's something that is keeping us on our boots. Uh, and from there, yes, we'll be focusing on the orbital class. And uh, that's that's something that we are targeting next year as well. So for the next one year, I think we're pretty much occupied with our uh, vision and our milestones that we have to meet. So that's exactly what we'll be focusing on. Okay, so let's talk about missions and milestones. And let me ask Oves that, uh, uh, founder and CEO of Pixel. Oves, many thanks for joining us. Uh, and again, for the benefit of our viewers, you know, like Pavan, you've managed to deal with the capital constraint. In fact, you've raised about $35 million to date. A whole host of investors, including the likes of Lightspeed, Bloom, et cetera, uh, raised another $25 million, uh, in April this year of 2022. Oves, uh, where, what is the milestone that you're hoping to clock What's the priority? Thanks for having me, Shireen. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, we, we kick-started the journey in April of this year after a long wait and in sending India's first private commercial satellite up there. Um, and then, uh, you know, finally, in last Saturday, we launched the first satellite that we worked on, um, which was Anand, that finally went up on the ISRO PSLV rocket. So seeing India's first private commercial satellite that we started work on, launching on an Indian workhorse PSLV was obviously a great moment. Um, there were about 50, 60 folks from our company that went up all the way to Sri Harikota to, to see the launch. Um, so the major milestone up until this point essentially was to be able to show that we as a company can build and launch space hardware that works in space and then can beam down imagery because building hardware on ground is an entirely different uh, magnitude of problem from having something in space that can actually work, um, as I am sure all of us here would agree. Um, so getting that up there and actually beaming down imagery was the first big milestone that we were focusing on. That was the, the past two to three years of our uh, of our work at Pixel. And then um, the next step is showing that there is a market for this, right? You can raise as much investment as you want. You can mm -hmm. raise as many funding as you want. Um, but then if you don't have the customers paying for the imagery that you're getting, if you're not generating revenue, uh, then you can't build a sustainable business, which is uh, in the end what this is all about. So we are currently in the process of working on six commercial grade satellites, which will be much larger, which will have a much longer lifetime. Um, and we are already funded for those with the, the round that we raised earlier this year. So I think, um, you know, we are heads down working on these satellites, sending them up there. And then the next big milestone is showing that we can be a commercially sustainable company. So uh, a quick uh, follow-up question of six commercially graded satellites. When are you expecting to uh, to put them out there? Uh, when do they go up? And secondly, you talked about something very important. I want each one of you to address that issue. Uh, you know, revenue potential, the market opportunity, uh, and the monetization capability of each of these ideas and each of these businesses. And, you know, I know that Pixel, for instance, has already launched uh, uh, or already inked about uh, uh, agreements with 50 customers so far. Give us a sense of the size of this market, the kind of opportunity and revenue potential that you're looking at? Absolutely. So I think answering your first question with regards to the six satellites, they are already in production right now in the lab behind me here. 
uh, and they'll be ready for uh, for launch by the middle of next year. So in the second half of next year, we intend to put six of these satellites up there, and then these six will provide us with global coverage every two days. So no matter what geography we're looking at, whether that's India here or whether that's the North America on the opposite side of the world, we'll be able to see an image of a place and then repeat that every two days, and that's possible for every part of the world. So that's going to happen uh, in the second half of next year, uh, and we're already on our on our, on our way to that. In terms of the market opportunity, you know, there are there are two strategies for us. In India, it's to grow the ecosystem because apart from government agencies working with ISRO and procuring satellite imagery, um, that's been the only ecosystem. Now there are few startups that have come up, but it needs to significantly grow to when large enterprises that can actually uh, buy imagery from us and understand why buying this is important. Um, as of now, out of the 60 uh, to 70 customers that we have globally, 90% of them come from uh, North America and Europe. Um, the total market size for Earth observation today in the world is about $5 billion on just the data sales and then an additional $10 billion on the analytics that you can layer on top of that, right? Um, and, and all of this is right now taken up by companies predominantly in North America and a few in Europe. The plan is that in the next five years, we become one of those players, starting out from India, building for the world uh, that will be able to do this. Most of our contracts will end up being many multi-year, multi-million dollar contracts with the with subscription level um, data mm -hmm. sets that we'll be able to provide them. Well, uh, you know, uh, based in India, but uh, taking the model and uh, servicing the opportunity that the world offers at this point in time, that's clearly going to be part of the strategy for each one of you, I would imagine. But Chaitanya, uh, let me come to you and address the Dhruva story, because you've got a couple of years on these gentlemen, one 2018, one 2019, one 2017. So uh, Chaitanya, I want to understand from you the experience of actually setting up Dhruva as a full stack service provider and where you see the market opening up uh, as of today and pick up on the point that uh, Obes was, uh, was mentioning of how India and Indian companies like yours uh, can service the global market. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, technically we have about five years on any one of them, so, uh, considering we started off in 2012. <laughs> but the market was completely different and we really, you know, the market started kicking off in... Uh, 2018, 2019 timeframe, that's when we restarted Dhruva and uh, while we carry a lot of legacy that helped us in the new iteration, that's when uh, we started everything off. And we do strongly believe in the full stack solution uh, story. And when we started off, people are like, you guys are doing too much, it's too wide a breadth. But today I can confidently say that we are executing projects across the board. Uh, something that's been close to us is that uh, we need to work with the customers and uh, start launching a, all our missions based on the customer requirements. So that's been going well. Uh, and yes, uh, building in India for the world has been our tagline uh, right from the start. Uh, we, <laughs> back in 2012, when Dhruva first started, one of the reasons Sanjay started the firm was because he built his first satellite as a student. And he's seen how much of a difference the costs across the border, like uh, compared to India, uh, he's built his satellites in Europe, he's built in Singapore, etc. So he's like, it's one is to five ratio, at least on most of the systems. So, and we're a billion people out here in the country, and that's where the whole story started. And uh, yeah, we strongly believe that, you know, we can address the whole uh, global market I think currently we stand at about uh, two to three percent of the global space economy, and uh, yeah. with the privatization and the great push that ISRO in space and the current uh, regime has been giving, uh, we think we can easily uh, scale up that percentage to much higher numbers. Easy. Yep. Chaitanya, you know, I want to understand from you. We, we were talking about milestones, future milestones that you hope to clock. Uh, as well as the areas that you intend to focus on. So take me through what we can now expect as far as Dhruva is concerned in the next few years. So uh, going down the line, uh, satellite manufacturing and of course ground stations uh, along with it has been a core interest. So uh, we've demonstrated our smallest class satellite, the P dot uh, that I have over here. But going down the line, we are looking at uh, larger satellites, the 30 kg class and uh, 100 kilo class satellites that uh, we are developing and uh, hope to put it in the orbit. We already have good interest uh, from the customers, so we are looking at working with them and launching uh, these satellites into space, uh, hopefully in the next couple of years. 
Okay, uh, that's and good also to hear. Going down uh, the line, what I want to now address is, is sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Also, uh, we also want to start working more on the constellation uh, probabilities and building up to the constellation, be it for us or be it for the uh, customers. So uh, that's something else that's in the uh, pipeline now. Well, you know, uh, what I want to address with each one of you, and uh, uh, Pavan, let me get you to address that. This whole business of space economics, we were addressing the issue of the opportunity that is available for the taking at this point in time, uh, and the opportunity that each one of you is going after. But more importantly, also on the cost side, because you have some fairly aggressive aspirations and targets that you've set as far as the cost side is concerned. Uh, uh, Pavan, you talk about uh, bringing down the costs by almost... 50%, uh, that's the aim for Skyru to cut satellite launch costs by up to 50%. So if you can address both those issues, uh, the monetization and the revenue potential, as well as what you're hoping to do on the cost side and how you intend to bring costs down by 50%. Yeah, so firstly, in fact, uh, like even Chaitanya mentioned, right, uh, so the global space economy is close to $400 billion, but India's share is less than 2%. And in specifically for launch, uh, which, you know, Skyroot uh, uh, offers, you know, it's less than even 1% of the global market. So there's ample opportunity, even though India is like uh, one of the top five uh, space pairing nations, uh, you know, the global share, the global pie is uh, pretty small. Uh, that's where the new reforms will open up, uh, uh, you know, to a larger pie, you know, once uh, uh, all the companies get operational in the next few years. Uh, so space launch per se, you know, today it's around $10 billion market. It's set to grow to a $50 billion market soon. And then, uh, you know, with uh, us, you know, we want to uh, innovate uh, to a level where, uh, you know, we can reduce slash down the cost by, you know, 50%. It can be done. In fact, India has one big advantage. It is like by default, there's a good cost advantage. In fact, the kind of advantage we get in the IT sector, you know, similar, we also get uh, something in the high tech sector like space as well, you know, with the 60 years of, uh, you know, great infrastructure built in the country with the kind of expertise built in the country, you know, the ecosystem built in the country over the 60 years. I think building on top of that, I think uh, there's a cost is a default to that, but of course, you know, you cannot go beyond a level without a next level of innovation coming into the picture. Let me get uh, uh, Moin to come in on that as well. Moin, just to pick up on what we heard there uh, from Pavan on being able to address the cost issue and bring down costs quite significantly. Uh, and the other aspiration uh, that Pavan spoke of was that, you know, make make uh, companies like yours the sort of o Uber or Ola in space where it's as easy as booking a cab uh, to send a rocket up. Moin, you know, e is it going to really be as simple as that? Uh, uh, or, or are we overestimating uh, the ease as well as the potential? Well, so it's a twofold question, so let me answer the first part of it. Being Indians, I think the first factor that we all focus is like reducing the cost, being more affordable for any customer that we could be. So that's the first aspect that we have. Yes, obviously in this uh, in this course, we have also been like, you know, thinking about how to reduce the price. In, in this aspect, we figured out providing flexibility to the customers. For example, like, you know, we have the ability to reduce the uh, number of engines depending upon the payload that we'll be carrying. So all of these advantages come into play just in with respect to reduce the cost of the vehicle so far so that we can actually provide a better cost competition to the uh, customers that we'll be having. So that's that's the first cost perspective that any company will be focusing on. The second aspect of it, like you know, as you as you were mentioning about like, is it really going to be Ola or Uber? Uh, rocket science is like one aspect where something works, it will work. You don't need to change anything. So if you figured out that part, it is our understanding that you know, it is going to exactly be like you know the Ola or the Uber. So uh, even if somebody ask, asks, what is your uh, business model? It's just transportation business. Point A being ground and point B being space. So whether you call it as yeah. like you know, Ola or Uber or Agnikul or Skyroad, that's exactly how it is going to be. So I think that is how we should be looking at things. Well, you know, you make rocket science look very easy, gentlemen, and I don't, I don't know if that is the case. So, uh, but, but uh, I, I'm certainly inspired, uh, inspired by your confidence. But before I get away, said Moina, uh, December is going to be a big, big month uh, for Agniko with the Agni ban. Yes, I think we'll have a launch uh, in the month of December. Yes, I think it's officially started. So yeah, this month we can expect a launch from us. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Okay, so the count. 
the countdown has has quite literally begun. Uh, do you want to leave us with a date? Uh, I think we have to figure it out through the in space and this row. So we'll, we'll, we'll go through those particular channels and then I think we'll get you to the date as well. Well, well you know, we look to having you back with us uh, as, as and when you meet that date with the date. But uh, Oasa, let, let's, uh, let's address the economics issue with you because that was the one that you had uh, sort of brought up. Uh, and in terms of the kind of visibility and the kind of uh, response that you are starting to see from clients, investors, as you pointed out, now uh, believe in this story because they actually have something to go by. But what's the kind of response that you're also seeing coming in from clients as well as the, the niches that are opening up in terms of the addressable markets? Sure. So I think, uh, you know, the, the good thing has been that uh, this is when we started looking at hyperspectral data, we we didn't want to start with something that someone else had done in some other country and then replicate that here in the country. We wanted to very clearly focus on something that no one else in the world had done. So when we started in 2019, there existed no way of obtaining hyperspectral data from space, which would help us see a lot more things with regards to the health of the planet. Uh, and we said, if this is a data set that's not available out there on the internet, we will build our own satellites then to provide it. And even today, we are the only ones that are currently operating a hyperspectral commercial satellite from space, which also happens to be the highest resolution one. So thanks to that, um, a lot of clients that had the need for this data, which we had validated before we even got started manufacturing on this, they reached out to us through our website. They reached out to us on our email asking us, that this is the data set that they require. Mining companies reached out saying we need help with containing the, the, the environmental impact that the mines have had. Oil and gas companies have reached out to us telling us that there are leaks that occur in these pipelines and we need satellite help to be able to see where those leaks are occurring and when they are occurring. Agricultural companies are coming to us to, to get a sense of how healthy the crops are or the soil is or what nutrients are missing from there. So I think we've been lucky that way that we managed to focus on a technology that was missing globally and we decided that we would build it um, for the first time and then plans are coming there of course there's another aspect to that where our own team continuously reaches out to to clients around the group to be able to say here's hyperspectral data here's how it can help make your operations more efficient mm. or save you more money um and then they they uh, you know we, we move ahead from there so as I said, about uh, about 60 customers already signed on out of which 90 percent are are uh, abo yeah. abroad India um, but we are, we are starting to see money already starting to come. And I think that's the biggest validation that when you have uh, some technology that you have built and then customers are starting to pay for that data, uh, that happens. In our case, we didn't really look at the economics that much. We wanted to focus on, on the premium data set, right? Uh. The, the cost aspect and the cost savings and the efficiency that come from manufacturing here in Bangalore yeah. are obviously a big big bonus but from our perspective we want to provide a premium data set to our customers that they don't have access to today that they will not get access to in the close run um, and that's why we can still charge the same amount of uh, prices that anyone else is able to charge globally at the same time our costs and spendings are much lower meaning that we have much higher margin so we look at cost as a big uh, bonus um, focusing on the innovation aspect of it providing something that no one else has access to but uh, absolutely being here has its advantages in terms of keeping things very very low cost and efficient which is important if we need to grow the pie of the economy uh, if you need to make that yeah. 400 billion dollars a trillion Absolutely. dollars in the year, that's important for us to do Yes, and uh, and each of you are going to help in growing that pie, so to speak. But Chaitanya, uh, you know, uh, since we talked about the fact that this is, uh, of course, a sunrise sector, a nascent sector in India, 100 plus startups already in this space. As someone uh, who has a decade long experience of of being in this space, being there and done that, uh, what is it that you would you would hold out in terms of of the checklist on those who are looking at this opportunity? One, perseverance, and two, having to be meticulous, right? So uh, the amount of testing that our team has done for every bit of launch, be it on the uh, satellite, be it on the ground segment, is just immense. Like, they did not leave anything to chance. So, and typically, if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. And once you're in space, you can't uh, really handle it, and <laughs> it could have repercussions. So it's necessary that, you know, who's coming yeah. in, they do have that uh, drive and also have a long-term vision where they're going. Because it is end of the day, yeah. relatively, it's a deep tech sector. So you can't expect someone to be, okay, today uh, we do it tomorrow. I change my idea day after tomorrow. That's not going to sustain. So mm. it's necessary to have like a really long-term uh, 
plan and understand what's needed in sector. So, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Meticulous, uh, consistent, and of course, uh, uh, you know, detail-oriented. Uh, that is going to have to be the mindset. Gentlemen, I'm going to end by asking you, you know, so many comparisons, and, and I think the, the one that has captured everyone's imagination is the comparison with Musk. Pavan, let me start by asking you, I mean, I, I don't know how many times you've been asked or you've been called uh, the, the Elon Musk of India and so on and so forth. I mean, when you hear things like that, what does it make you feel? And, and what is the inspiration today? Yeah, so, so definitely, I think uh, Musk has been an inspiration for, uh, you know, many, many space entrepreneurs and the space sector as a whole, for sure. And, uh, you know, just because people associate rockets with Musk, you know, we get uh, almost, I'm sure everybody gets asked this question, you know, anything we do in space, uh, you know, are you with the Elon Musk of India? So this this uh, keeps coming a lot. But of course, you know, I think it's, it's time to build our own uh, X or Y or Z from the country. Uh, I think, you know, with our own independent identity, do our own different way. And of course, you know, getting uh, inspired by star words like, you know, Elon. Yeah. Congratulations to each one of you. Uh, we wish you the very best of luck and look forward to having uh, you back here uh, as you clock more milestones. Thanks very much for your time. That's a wrap on this very special edition of Young Turks from all of us here on the show. Goodbye. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned.